Welcome to the meeting of the Environment and Climate Change Overview and Scrutiny Committee, which is taking place in Sparkenau Committee Room at County Hall, Glenfield. Though some officers will be joining online via Microsoft Teams, this meeting is being webcast uh, live to the public on YouTube. Please, members, turn on uh, your microphones when you're speaking and turn them off when you've finished. Um, can I welcome to the committee, uh, Mr. C. Smith, who is uh, replacing Mr. Chapman, um, Mr. Allen, who is replacing Mr. Harrison Rushton, um, and I have received belated um, apologies from Mrs. Rosita Page. Um, okay, I'll go to agenda item one. Um, which is the minutes of the meeting held on the 21st of June uh, 2022. And I propose the minutes of the meeting held on the 21st of June are taken as read, confirmed and signed. Um, are we agreed? Thank you, everybody. Number two, uh, question time. I have received no questions from members of the public. Three. Questions asked by members under Standing Order 7.3 and 7.5. Uh, I've received no questions from members. Uh, agenda item four, to advise of any other items which I've decided to take as urgent elsewhere on the agenda, and there are no urgent items. Number five is declarations of interest in respect of items on the agendas. Uh, I invite members who wish to do so to make declarations of interest in respect of items on the agenda at this meeting. There are none. Thank you, members. Mm -hmm. Declarations of the party whip in accordance with overview and scrutiny procedure rule 16. Are there any such declarations of the party whip? No, thank you. Presentation of petitions under Standing Order 35. Um, I have not received any petitions. And so agenda item eight, our first substantive item is the net zero Leicestershire strategy and action plan as set out on page nine to, oh, sorry, pages nine to 154 of your agenda pack. Now, members will also have received the supplementary pack with the full net zero consultation summary attached to provide greater charity rega uh, clarity regarding some of the, uh, the percentages contained in the covering report. We've also received a copy of the report to be considered by the Cabinet on the 25th of October. Uh, Katie Greenhalgh, Environment and Net Zero Carbon Programme Lead, will introduce this item. Um, I, I'm aware of an inquiry uh, which was received by officers from a member of the public concerning transport emissions. And I've asked Katie uh, and officers to address this as part of their presentation of the report. Um, I quickly go to Joanna Guile uh, to uh, just uh, start uh, the, the ball rolling here and may I also welcome um, lead member uh, Blake to the meeting. Joanna. Thank you Chair. Um, I won't steal any of, of Katie's thunder but I think if it hasn't been sort of confirmed already members of this committee kindly considered the draft documentation for the net zero strategy and action plan as part of the live consultation and Katie will allude to that consultation and the results of that, but certainly try to highlight the changes that we've tried to make to the documentation that's going to go to Cabinet as a result of that. And obviously, we would really value any thoughts before it goes on to Cabinet next week. And through you, Chair, depending on how you wish to take questions at the end, I'll will be, will be steered by yourself, whether it's to take each of the big documents and open it up for questions, but I'll leave that to yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, Right, um, we'll decide as we go through. I think I'm, I'm, I'm content to let Katie uh, take us through the changes uh, to the document um, and highlight what those are and of course cover that question which we received very late uh, from a member of the public, but we're going to try and do our best to incorporate that in in our answers. Katie, when you're ready. OK, thank you very much. Can you hear me OK? 
we can, yes. Brilliant, thank you. Right, I'm just going to run through the report, which is to be presented to Cabinet next week. Um, so the purpose of the report is to provide an overview of the findings of the public consultation, which we held over the summer into the draft Net Zero Leicestershire Strategy and Action Plan, and also to present the updated versions of that strategy and action plan, um, seeking approval for their submission to County Council in December. So the recommendations that have been taken to Cabinet are to note the findings of the public consultation, to support the amendments that we've made in response to the consultation findings, to um, provide uh, approval for it to be submitted to County Council in December. And we've also asked for delegated authority to the Director of Environment and Transport in consultation with the lead member to make further minor amendments to the strategy and action plan. So of course we want to take on feedback from this scrutiny committee and from Cabinet next week and just to finalise a few parts of the strategy and action plan. So reasons for those recommendations, we really wanted to make sure that we'd given the public the opportunity to comment on the strategy and action plan um, and incorporate their feedback into later versions. Um, we recognise the importance of achieving net zero for Leicestershire um, and very importantly working with others to achieve that, recognising that there's a limit to the emissions that the County Council can control and influence. Um, and because of the significance of the strategy being a county-wide strategy, working with a range of partners, um, it's considered important for it to go to County Council for approval. So in terms of the timetable, um, we're obviously here today at Scrutiny Committee. We're um, intending to take this report to Cabinet next week, and that's on the 25th. So apologies that there's a, a typo in paragraph six of the report. Um, and then we intend to go to County Council on the 7th of December. So the next section really provides the context for this strategy and action plan, and it's really responding to the climate emergency that we declared in 2019 and recognition for the urgency of action that's required to tackle climate change in the county. Now, we committed to achieving net zero for our own operations by 2030, and a range of reports have been presented to demonstrate how we'll get there. We've also declared a commitment to try and stay within what's considered a safe level of warming of 1.5 degrees in line with the Paris Agreement. And that essentially means that Leicestershire needs to achieve net zero by 2050 or before with significant reductions by 2030. We've amended our strategic plans um, in alignment with this, and we've also signed up to a UK 100 pledge to bring forward that 2050 date by five years to 2045 to demonstrate the urgency with which we need to act. And tackling climate change and protecting the environment is also central to the Council's strategic plan under the clean and green outcome. Now, in terms of resource implications of the strategy, there are no resource implications that directly arise from this report. We're still working within an approved budget we have of £450,000, which was allocated in 2019. And that's been used to commission research into the county's um, emissions and also to deliver a range of enabling actions, including development of this strategy and action plan. We have enough allocation remaining to focus on some of the next priorities, including a funding plan, which will look at how we maximise grants and investment into the county to pay for net zero delivery going forward, as well as an engagement plan to look at how we can work with others and encourage them to take action in partnership with us. It is recognised that achieving net zero cannot be funded by the council alone, so that funding plan in particular is going to be very important, but we will develop standalone business cases where there's a need for the county to take action, the county council to take action. And we do have a £2 million environment fund um, allocated in the medium term financial strategy, which can support any action we need to take towards net zero. So I'll move on to the main body of the report now, part B. Now this starts with some background into the research that I mentioned we'd had commissioned, and I won't go into that into detail because the committee has had um, a presentation on this earlier in the year, 
but it does um, have kind of key recommendations that we need to work in partnership to achieve the countywide net zero target, that the pathway is really challenging, but it can be achieved if we act at pace and scale. And again, just reiterating that investment is needed from all sectors. So we use that um, research to develop our draft strategy and action plan, which went out to public consultation in May to July this year. Now, the objectives of that consultation were to inform residents and stakeholders about climate change and the need to act urgently, to provide, provide an overview of the draft strategy, to invite feedback on that strategy, to test um, agreement with the objectives that we identified, to open discussions about how we can work together to achieve net zero and to hear a diverse range of views. And because the impact of climate change and the action needed is so broad, we had a similarly broad target audience. So we wanted to speak to residents of Leicestershire, particularly young people, because of the impact that climate change will have on them in the future. We tried to engage with community, voluntary, social enterprises and charities, with businesses, the public sector, the education sector and our own employees and elected members. We did this through a whole range of means. So we had a Have Your Say survey hosted on our website, which was also available in paper format. And we supported that with a range of supporting activity. We contacted key stakeholders directly. We attended internal and external meetings and partnerships. We attended public events and we held a standalone net zero roadshow across a range of our sites. We also held three dedicated workshops with town and parish councils, with key stakeholders and with community action groups. And we had an extensive communications plan. We also had a standalone contract with participation people that delivered dedicated youth engagement. And I'll describe that in a bit more detail shortly. So across all of those types of engagement, we had around 1400 responses. And the key findings of that are attached in Appendix A, but I'll run through some of those now. As the chair mentioned, we've also released our full consultation results report so that if you want more detail into the responses, they are now available. So in terms of the Have Your Say survey, we had 593 responses and most of those that responded did, did have some knowledge of net zero, although 11% didn't believe that climate change was a man-made um, occurrence. 60% were concerned about climate change, however, and over half didn't feel informed about the work that we were doing to address climate change. There was mixed response to the support for the strategy's vision and goals, so about half of respondents agreed. But of those that didn't agree, about 20% called for more ambition, whilst 15% stated that climate change was a natural phenomenon. So it really demonstrates that there were quite polarised views on climate change. This was replicated in questions around the targets included within the strategy. And this time, an additional 11% felt that they weren't achievable. And this was usually because people considered climate change to be a global issue with Leicestershire having limited impact on it. There were also concerns raised by residents about the cost of delivering the targets. And this was usually the individual cost, so the cost of, of taking action on a, on a personal level. Of the themes that we identified within the action plan, buildings and nature were identified as the most important, followed by transport and then the economy and communities. In terms of those that responded, um, they were generally in line with a representative sample of the Leicestershire population. However, some groups were underrepresented, for example, females and those under 25. However, we did have the standalone youth engagement, which I'll go through in a moment. In terms of the other activity, this included the events, workshops, etc. And we sourced an additional 220 um, sets of feedback through this, as well as having a really successful communications campaign with over, over 200,000 social media impressions, leading to a significant number of views of the consultation page and downloads of the strategy. So I've referenced the youth engagement. Um, this was delivered through an organisation called Participation People, who have a team of young researchers who designed their own survey aimed specifically at young people. 
They also held listening labs and a creative competition and through that heard from 592 young people in Leicestershire. And they identified some key priorities for young people, including supporting schools and homes to use renewable energy, um, improving recycling, tree planting, and giving young people um, more power in decision making. So through analysing the responses we received across all of those sources of engagement, we identified 12 key themes which we've tried to respond to in the updated versions of the strategy and action plan. So the first was a call for us to collaborate and work with others to deliver net zero, an ask of us to provide leadership and ensure sufficient levels of buy-in and ambition, to make sure the strategy was understandable and accessible, to include interim targets and um, details on how we will monitor and report on the strategy and action plan, and to consider the costs and benefits of the action plan, as well as raising awareness and improving education and facilitating behaviour change. And the remaining themes were more focused on specific areas of emissions that people thought were important, including transport, local planning, renewable energy, energy efficiency, nature and waste management. So the table in paragraph 39 outlines the changes that we've made to the strategy and action plan in response to that feedback. And I'm not intending to go through every point, but I thought I'd just pull out some of the key changes that we've made. So in terms of collaborating and working with others, this was already really important to us as we recognise the limit to the control and influence that the county council has on the county's emissions. But we've really tried to improve the narrative on this. So we've included a section on how we'll ensure success by working with others. We've specified who needs to be involved and made really clear in the action plan which of the actions we will lead as to those that will ask others to lead on or those that will seek to influence and we've also included a section on how individuals can support um, net zero action. We've also included um, a key next step which I've mentioned previously the engagement plan which will look at how we work with others and encourage them to take action. In terms of leadership, we've now made publicly available our internal action plan, so how the county will get to net zero by 2030, which is attached to this report as Appendix D. And we've tried to make much clearer um, the interim target that was already included. We've added a new ambition to develop five year carbon budget so that it should be a lot more transparent how we're aiming to get to net zero and not just focusing on that end goal, but the pathway to getting there. And we've also added a section around next steps to recognise that this isn't a perfect document, but we've got more work to do to improve our approach to get into net zero. In terms of making the strategy more understandable and accessible, I think the main change is that we've split it into two documents. So we now have the long term strategy and the short term action plan, which has that framework for delivery over the next five years. We've tried to reduce complexity, for example, our approach to prioritise in actions. And we've also grouped actions in the table so that it's easier for people to find what they're looking for. So, for example, if you're interested in public transport, all of those actions are now together. If you're interested in electric vehicles, similarly, those are all together. And we've removed any actions which are in our internal plan to avoid duplication. As I mentioned before, we already had interim targets and a monitoring and reporting framework, but we've just tried to make this much clearer and drawn out those key pieces of information that people were looking for. And in terms of the cost benefit, I've mentioned the funding plan. That's going to be a really key piece of work for us to focus on next to look at how we draw in as much grant and investment as possible to deliver net zero in the future. We've also added information on fuel poverty and a just transition to recognise that there are groups of our residents which will need more support to take action towards net zero. And the engagement plan will be the main route that we address, uh, raising awareness, um, improving education and behaviour change. So the next set of themes are to do with specific emissions, the first of which are transport. Um, and the chair mentioned we've received an extra question on this. 
Um, so I think transport is our first action table. It's our largest area of emissions. And it's also the area of emissions which is decarbonising the slowest. Um, that's a national trend which we've seen. So transport emissions are reducing slower than any other area of emissions. So it's a really big challenge for us. But we've got a couple of key actions which we're prioritising delivery of, which will help us shape that pathway to decarbonising transport. The first of those is our local transport plan four. So this will really set out the vision for transport in Leicestershire in the future. And uh, it has carbon reduction at the heart of that. So it will really help us shape delivery and policy related to transport in the future. We've also got the electric vehicle strategy, which will look at demand for electric vehicles, how we can accelerate um, the change to electric vehicles and how we can support um, electric vehicle charging infrastructure to make that more feasible. And that's alongside a whole plethora of other actions, which we as a county council will deliver, but we've also um, demonstrated where partners can deliver in terms of reducing uh, transport emissions. So a big challenge for us, but one that we're focused on addressing. The other area of, of emissions reduction that were important to the public included local planning. And we've got a number of actions around local planning and how we'll work with districts to manage emissions associated with growth. Um, there were uh, a call for us to focus on renewable energy and we had a range of renewable energy actions in there but they were perhaps not very easy to find so we've renamed a theme buildings and energy grouped all the renewable energy actions together and similarly with energy efficiency and low carbon heat we already had a theme focused on nature and we've reviewed those actions to make sure that they're adequate um, and then finally for waste management we've actually created a new action table titled resources and waste which pulls out the waste actions into one area and has expanded on them to include use of materials sustainable food and water so you can find all of the changes that we've made in the updated versions of the strategy and action plan which are appended to this report alongside our internal plan and the report just concludes by looking at the equalities implications and the environmental implications so we've completed an equality and human rights impact assessment screening which has come out with a neutral impact but we recognise that each of the projects and actions will likely need their own screening and assessment to ensure that equalities are adequately addressed. And in terms of the environment, if delivered well, this strategy should have a huge range of co-benefits for the environment, um, which we hope to maximise upon, particularly through the nature and land use area of the action plan. There are some background papers there, um, most importantly, perhaps the link to the research that I mentioned briefly earlier and the documents that we used within the consultation. And then it goes on to the documents themselves. So I, I'll pause there and hand back to you, Chair, for any questions. Thank you, Katie. Very comprehensive. For, and uh, thank you for outlining the uh, very difficult geography um, that we're negotiating uh, at this point. Um, right, nothing more from me at the moment. Um, I'm going to throw this open to members straight away uh, with uh, points or questions. Mr. Bolden. Thanks, Chair. Very interesting report. 445 pages of it. Um, of course, you can always pick bits out of it you wish to criticise and uh, not agree with, but I'm not here to do that this afternoon. We've had two goes at this already, so um, some questions I'd like to ask, and perhaps the first one is directed to uh, Blake. Uh, the Cabinet allocated the £450,000. That's been referred to this afternoon, but how much of that money is left to be used for this project? In other words, how much has been spent already? We've been told this afternoon some of the things been spent on, but what the rest of the money going to be spent on? Um, that's the first question. Do you want to ask that one first, Chair? Because I've got about six questions. Um, I'd, I'd like you to table them in groups, please, Mr. Bolter, if you can, so we can handle them. So that's the first you... one to, to break. The rest you... is for officers. Right. OK. Um, lead member. I'm going to defer 
um, the detail of that to to Joe, who's the assistant director of the department, who um, would would be closer to the actual um, delivery and the apportionment of the budgets within the department and across the council. But what I would say is that um, budget was allocated in 2019. There's been a huge amount of work since 2019, as you well know, including all of the evidence bases that underpin the strategy that we're considering today. Um, obviously, there is a cost, an ongoing cost to delivering um, the, the, the action plan and working with partners, etc. And moving forward, they will be baked into the core budgets of the council via the various departments. There won't be, if you like, a, a separate pot of money of how many millions that we will spend specifically. Um, this will be business as usual. This is, you know, it's set to stay. We are a green council, a clean and green council. We have a corporate strategy that emphasises the clean and green nature of what we are seeking to do here. And um, it is my understanding that uh, the, the budgets here on in to deliver the various projects will be baked into the core expenditure of the council uh, moving forward. Okay. Next questions, Mr. Bolter. Oh, oh sorry, Chair. Joe. Chair, just on, and it's not that I wouldn't supply the information to my lead member, but he probably doesn't need to scrutinise every line in the budget, so apologies, that sits with me. Um, of the 450,000, and this is kind of a budgetary accounting thing, we haven't spent any of it yet, but that is because I have managed to cover the costs in the bottom line of the department um so we haven't had to draw against it but what it has been used for is to support the production of the roadmap the consultation work that we've done the youth engagement so we have in real terms i can identify how much we've spent but i've managed to contain some of those costs so that we can elongate the investment of that money which is centrally held as a one-off fund so that we can use it to go into delivery. So we've been trying to make sure that we have as much of that capacity retained as possible. Thank you. Mr. Bolter. Mr. Bolter, they work together extremely well. Uh, so um, I, I will let the lead member, of course, make a political statement. Well, we're coming up to a budgetary um, setting process, um, and it's no secret that the County Council um, is in some dire financial economic times, I think it's been put. Um, and um, it's also no secret that we are busy at the moment, every single department looking at where potential efficiency savings can come from. But in reference to the specific 450, that was earmarked in 2019. And it is my understanding that is still earmarked for um, the clean green agenda here at the County Council. Um, that said, we are having to look through all actions of the department and across the department at where potential efficiencies or savings can be made moving forward. Right, um, maybe you could group the next questions uh, together, Mr. Bold, please. More than 93 people replied to the, uh, the main survey. Uh, then we've got 570 youth replied to the survey. Now we're here this afternoon for the first time, there's 1,400 people replied. So I've got three figures, which we take for the for the consultation, 1,400, 593 or the 470. Or do we have the two together? Chair, if I can just come in, and Katie may want to as well, because her team have, have worked on this, but the, the cumulative response rate that we got was the 1,400 awesome. figure that you're quoting. So it, it is broken down into we had almost half of that was from that sort of youth cohort that was an ambition of Cabinet to really try and engage with young people. But it is made up of different channels that we secured feedback from, but the 1,400 is the sort of cumulative response rate that we got for the consultation. OK, all right. Yep. Uh, the next one, Chair, if I may. Um, page 50 uh, of the report. Um, we talked about the hydro uh, trials with the large vehicles. Um, 
We talked about this some time ago and some of the convert sort of converted a little while ago. How's that trial going? And will the rest of the vehicles be converted to hydro fuels in the near future? And what is the near future? OK, I'm going to let Joanna do that. And that, that's hydrogen you, you, you're talking about. Hydrogen fuel cell, hydrogen. Yes. So hydro diesel. Well, um, OK, I'll let uh, I'll, I'll let a deputy director deal with that. I think we're talking about hydrogenated vegetable oil, HVO. Yes. So we're yes. doing trials on that. We like the term hydrogen. <laughs> this is vegetable oils. So yes. as opposed to white diesel. Yes. Um, what, what I can tell you is we are trialling HVO with a number of the large highways fleet. And there are plans to use it for some of the waste fleet. Um, there are no mechanical issues with sort of, in effect, flipping between white diesel and HVO. There are in the background some pieces of operational work being done just around what that looks like from a sort of procurement perspective and how we source HVO and the capacity in the market. But we are still progressing with those pilots on some of the big fleet. Are there any differences in the uh, emissions, though, between the two two types of uh, uh, fuel? I'd have to I'd have to check and come back to you specifically on the exact comparative. For example, if I run a thirty-two ton hook loader on HVO versus white diesel, I'd have to go away and have a look, and I can supply that outside of the meeting. What I can tell you is that under the internal carbon programme for the county council, you know, trying to get rid of all the carbon that we produce in terms of place leadership by 2030, um, we know that converting the fleet to HVO generates quite a few, over 2,000 tonnes from memory of carbon saving. So it has a significant contribution to that carbon saving. But in terms of the actual sort of technical emissions, I'll take that away. Thank you. Um, Right. Electric vehicles, sure, that's been raised. Mr. Bolter, can you pop your microphone on? Um, how, what about the disposal of the batteries of these vehicles? Has that been taken into account? How are they going to be disposed of in the future? Um, and what's the cost of breaking them down and using different components? Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. The, the batteries on electric vehicles, um, when they come to the end of their life, whatever that life is, how they're going to be disposed of, and what's the cost of that disposal, and who does it fall upon? Sorry, just to be clear, because we've moved away from big fleet, because we're not. Yes, but no, 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 we're talking about normal. You've got some vans outside of electric the vans, yes. I, Shall I have a go? I, I think you're talking about really an. Um, if you could take your microphone off, Mr. Bolt, I, I think you're talking about the national policy here in the long run and something which is still developing. So it might be tricky to actually give you a full answer, but the, the team will do its best. Lead member. Well, I, I was just going to say, I don't think anyone's qualified around this table to explain the engineering you know, issues with regards to you know, battery technology. I'm certainly not. But what I would say is um, from a corporate perspective, I suspect a lot of the vehicles that the county council use um, are perhaps even leased. So we don't necessarily so have to deal with you know the disposal of the batteries etc that would be for lease companies whoever the supplier of those particular vehicles are um, i could be wrong there but an organization such as the county council as any other large organization would typically run a fleet of vehicles based on that model thank you uh, i think we're talking about a commercial consideration here not something which uh, really we at county would be dealing with mr bolter the last question, Chair, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, on page 146, the county put money into the uh, solar farm at Quorn. Six million, just over six million pounds. Um, but for along that page, there's no um, annual savings quoted. It was it a business case for buying this solar farm? You know, what, what the life of this solar farm got? What's the payback time? Um, I don't know what committee it went to. 
if it went to a committee? Because I can't remember it coming here. Um, I can tell you, um, Mr Bolton, that that is a CAFE consideration, Corporate Asset Investment Fund uh, yeah. consideration. There was, it did go there and it, there was a saving shown, but I haven't a clue since it's not my remit to tell you what it is. I wonder if, if either it, lead member it's or... It's not on the report, you see, Chair, it's got blank. So I thought <laughs> if it had been done, it would have been in there. Uh, so my, I remember being asked to answer a question about this at the last but one for council, I think it was, and you're quite right, Chairman, um, the CAFE and the property department uh, would have taken the decision to continue the applications and recently those applications have been permitted and um, if I'm not mistaken, I think the farm will generate 9,170 megawatts of renewable elect electricity each year and that's enough to power more than 3,000 homes. Yeah. So it, it's a good contribution um, to you know the the grid, if you like, um, from the power generated from that particular farm. Um, but as far as I'm aware, the county council's interest is one of ownership, and they've recently got a permitted application. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Blake. I'm just going to ask Katie if she wants to add anything um, at that point. Katie. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I was just going to kind of reiterate what, what Blake has said. There was a robust business case for the solar farm um, that's been approved and it's looking to be um, starting on site later this year, being completed next year. Um, the business case improves with our kind of current fluctuations in energy prices. So as grid electricity increases, it makes solar energy even more um, attractive as an investment. So um, that business case was kind of static at the point of approval, but it is actually improving as, as time goes on and energy prices rise. So that renewable energy will protect us from price rises and also improve our energy security. Thank you, Katie just shows how we've embedded some of our green thinking already um, in uh, in our assets and our asset fund and funding right um members any any further questions or comments um, mr hunt thank you chair i've got one or two questions on the strategy and then one or two on the um but first i'd like to say i don't i, I didn't feel that um uh, the speaker gave justice to the question that was put by the public. We don't get many questions from the public and we haven't even read out the question, but that's on transport and I'll come to that perhaps in my second remarks. The other thing is I don't think we've had an adequate answer on the money being spent. It seems to be that um, it's, it's, it, it, it's a bit fluffy, but perhaps we could have a written answer on the money. Um, right. Uh, this is 90, this is this is 2022. Am I right? Yes, that's right. In in 2020, uh, the council set out to conduct its work in this area in two tranches. Tranche one, which was about our own operations, and tranche two, which was about the wider operation across the county, the one that we can't do on our own. And the the. Uh, on the first one, as far as our own operations are concerned, we were already on, on our way there and that's gone extremely well and uh, hats off to all those involved. I mean, this is a Green Council speaking from County Hall. Um, and um, as far as the, the second tranche is concerned, the mission was at that stage that we would go out and speak to our partners out in the wider county community and see how far we could take our um, objectives at, uh, beyond the council. Now, what's been done, and I don't quite know why, is that we've produced a, a plan going to 2045. There's no trajectory in there. There's no idea of when, <laughs> You know, of uh, you know how fast or how slow we're going to get there, except these sort of three vague uh, speeds. But that's not justified by anything we say. So I think we've set a we've set off as a very difficult task to create a plan going to 2045 uh, when we will be net carbon free. Uh, and I don't know why we've attempted such um, a difficult 
and long-term uh, strategy. I'm also worried about this sort of five year. If we're only going to look at it every five years, we're probably going to be talking to different offices every five years. So I do hope that whatever we do, it's revised and, and updated on an annual basis. Um, the, the particular question I've got is about fairness, because there's a section in the strategy that says everything must be fair. And my question is, fair to who? And I ask that because at the last meeting we have, an officer from the highways department, um, the, the assistant director, said that there are certain things we couldn't do on our local on local plans um, for one area because uh, it would be unfair to other areas. In other words, we were talking about fairness must be fairness between communities. And I thought, that's weird, you know, we're not talking about that, surely. On the other hand, we could be talking about fairness towards the 30 million people who are homeless in Pakistan because of, of dramatic floods. Or we could be talking about fairness to um, our government to try and uh, aspire to there. So I'm concerned that when we say we must be fair, we're setting up something which is going to allow us to say, well, we didn't do that because it wasn't fair. We didn't do a parking strategy because it wasn't fair on the motorist. We, you know, um, so I'd like to know when we say fairness, who is that to? Fairness to who? That's my main question on the on the strategy, Chair. Thank you, Mr. I think you're talking about unintended consequences. No, I'm talking about how we measure what we do, how we decide what we're going to do and what we're, what we're not going to do. And the officer in the last meeting said, well, we couldn't, um, in this case, I think it was creating um, uh, uh, some, some, some um, car dependency or otherwise between a local plan, plan and, and, and what existed. And we were told at the last meeting that, that we couldn't discriminate one community against another because it was unfair. I have no answer to that. Uh, the lead member may, uh, in his deliberations, no, no, cross that. I don't. I mean, it's it's one of those like Oxford University philosophical debates, isn't it? No, no, it's very define, practical. It's, it's, it's one community against another. Define define fairness. We'll all have a different view about that. I'm not sure if the report actually directly uses the word fairness. I think the word yeah. just. I think the word just is is the objective. Um, Climate justice, and then it talks about fairness. Even, it. even so, I mean, we can we can have a we can have a debate over a beer, Max, about you know what fairness means to each and every one of us. But just to address a couple of the points you made, um, and, to pick up, and, and to pick up one, why are we bothering with this strategy? Well, I think you know why we're bo bothering with this strategy. But I would say, Max, someone like yourself who cares about the environment, especially what we do in Leicestershire, mm -hmm. would be the first to call for a strategy if we didn't have one. So we've put one in place in no small part because people like yourself would um, expect the authority, especially having declared a climate emergency, to, to have a strategy in place. Um, in terms of the pathways that you cited, um, I, I take your point, but can I just, <laughs> it's a small typo error. Um, I've noticed on page 43 of the actual strategy and under the graph, the Paris Agreement um, territorial pathway, it says the Paris Agreement complaint territorial pathway at the moment. I think it's meant to say compliant. Mm. So if we can, if we can just just that word that will be that would be great but um it will be difficult to meet our objectives by 2050 yeah, there's a lot of risk there's a lot of volatility volatility a lot of political volatility as we're witnessing at the moment um there's a lot of resource volatility and there are no guarantees but what we do guarantee to do here um, at the county council is to try and work in partnership with all of the other organizations and um, interested people in terms of trying to get to to the targets that have been been set and these targets have largely been set nationally as well so we're trying to work under the auspices of national targets as well as um, self-imposed targets by our membership of um, organizations such as UK 100 so um, we're doing our best to set out a rational plan um, albeit challenging to to try and meet the targets that we're we've promoted China. 
I agree. I'm, I'm not going to add anything to the, 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 the challenge around fairness or just, but I know that officers are certainly trying to sort of focus on sort of the example being some of the fuel po poverty projects, trying to sort of help those most in need. This is a really difficult area because who, do, who defines who is benefiting, disbenefiting? I think the ambition is still that we are benefiting and moving forward in a positive footing. Uh, but I'll take that away, Max, in terms of re-looking at page 40. Uh, just on, on some of the other points that were mentioned earlier around <clears throat> long-term planning, in the government's 2050 or in our case 2045 target and it's impossible to know what the world will look like at that point and our five-year interim plans which I think is a good approach it's just to reaffirm the question was um, whether we would sort of get updates almost yeah. annually the intention is there will be an annual update on progress so even within those five-year chunks there will be updates and sorry I'm going way back in the meeting chair taking a huge liberty but Councillor Bolter did ask me about the emissions reduction and I do have an answer for you and we think it's about 95% reduction is what will be achieved from the HBO transition. Thank you. He's really smiling now, as we all are. That's brilliant. OK, good. Mr. Frisbee. Chair, thank you very much. I, I, I don't wish to dwell on it too much, but I am fascinated by this term unfairness. Um, have we got any anecdotal examples of injustice or unfairness that we can actually use to measure this against? Because I'm not entirely sure what the terms and definition of being unfair with the collective agenda of trying to uh, reduce carbon emissions are. So we, when we talk about unfairness, what do we mean? Have we got an example of, of unfairness that we can lever against? Joanne. I think Katie is is sort of in the background with her hand up. I think she'd just want to come in maybe on some of the work they've done around this just transition, if I could just allow Katie to come in, if that's okay, Chair. And okay, Katie, please. Yeah, I thought a good example could could be our approach to domestic retrofit, as, as Joe referenced earlier. Um, so, for example, we you know, we're asking households to insulate their homes and change their properties to reduce the carbon that they emit. Now, obviously, for some households, they're going to be able to do that. For other households, there's no way they could afford to spend money on insulation for their properties. Um, so I think where we can support with that just transition is the kind of um, interventions that we make to support um, a fair approach to domestic retrofit. Um, and two examples we've got um, that are alive at the moment are the Solar Together project and the Green Living Leicestershire project. Um, so Solar Together is a collective purchasing scheme um, where we've worked with the districts to um, gain support from residents for paying for solar panels themselves. So that kind of able to pay um, householder group. Um, and we've gone out and, and sourced competitive quotes from reputable um, installers um, in this kind of collective collective purchasing scheme. So that's one intervention we've used to help households reduce their carbon emissions where they're kind of more able to pay. But on the other end of the spectrum, the Green Living Leicestershire project, um, we're able to fund, we've secured funding from central government, again, alongside the districts to fund energy efficiency measures um, for those most in need. So between now and the end of March, we're hoping to install a whole range of measures to over 330 households that um, are in kind of the worst of, of fuel poverty and unable to make those changes for, for their households to reduce their bills and, and stay warm this winter. So I think there's a range of interventions we can make to ensure that the um, actions that we're suggesting, you know, we, we might just throw out an action that says um, retrofit your homes, but we need to consider what interventions we might have to make to ensure that that is just for residents of Leicestershire. So hopefully that is just one kind of example of how our approach might create a more just approach to net zero delivery. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Chair. So could we respond by actually saying it's not about fairness, it's about being uh, reasonable, responsible, affordable and equitable, really. F fairness is uh, perhaps a misuse of, of, of a word, really, in, I, my, in my humble opinion, Chair. I accept all those adjectives. Max, is that, are you happy with the equitable way that we're attempting well, I think the uh, to put the agenda into place for all? Well, the officer's given an example of fairness, but not in fairness, unfairness, I should say. And the uh, example given by officer at the last meeting was if we do this transport intervention, can't remember what it was, that would be unfair 
because other communities um, would be uh, advantaged over them. That was the advantage given. But, uh, I, you know, the, the solar um, project is an excellent project. I did have a response from one of my constituents to say it wasn't fair because his company wasn't included. <laughs> but but uh, I really hope we can get that one restarted. OK, all right. Th thank you, Max. I, 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 I wondered whether you were going to stop. You see, you also mentioned the carbon reduction uh, area, which um, struck a bell with me in terms of the question that um, we were unable to table because of our protocol, but we're trying to deal with now uh, in, in, in terms of that one. Yeah, the transport one. Um, and in terms of reducing transport, of course, nationally, we have uh, a, a national uh, rail infrastructure policy and um, we can take containers off the road at the rate of 200 per train. Mm. Um, and uh, the national policy will link those container ports together across the whole of the country. Now, some would say, I don't want that next to me. That's unfair. I can yes. accept that. And, and it, it is a matter of trying to be equitable. Mm. Um, but I will say that having got a rail freight interchange in my uh, backyard, um, it, 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 that, that's, that's why the carbon is mm. what it is. Mm. But there are then mitigations that you can put into play and that will work through. So, yeah, it, it is a tricky geography and landscape, um, but being equitable and fair um, is what we're all about, and that's what we're attempting to do. And it, it, it is possible to reduce the carbon in both ways, in terms of then get electric trucks, etc., to come out of the rail freight to distribute. That is where we're going. But the main heavy heaving is, of course, deliverable by the rail freight interchanges, and so we go on. We we can you know we could apply your your principle in all sorts of ways there. Any further questions? Uh, Would you like me to ask my questions about the action plan? I don't want to. If you'd like to, that'd be great. Thank you. Else. I just didn't want you to go away no, no. unfulfilled, Mister. Well, I, I, I've told you I'm unfulfilled, in, including the dialogue with partners, which we we have never had, and that's that's uh, as as far as the action plan is concerned. Most of the actions are um, praiseworthy in many respects, although they all have a cost. But none of them are what um, we term smart actions. Now, smart action is something which is specific. And if you take the local transport plan, that's not specific. That's a plan that, 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 that is in the waiting. Measurable, well, there are no measures for the carbon savings, for example, in any of them. Achievable, that's very much in doubt for many of them. Relevant, I would probably say they're all relevant. And time bound, well, most of them are simply listed as short. Now, the advantage of s s smart measures is self evident that we can all you know, judge them. There are 163 of them in total. And I would recommend that. That's about 150 too many. That, that if you've got a policy that you're aiming to achieve, you, can, you can't measure 163. But most of them, of the nature of, and I, I copied a phrase down, shaping the pathway, you know. Uh, and it reminds me of when. You know, I have a highways problem. It might be speeding. It might be potholes. Let's just take potholes. If I come back to residents and say, well, we're going to do some research on it. We're going to shape the pathway. We're going to produce a strategy. And then depending on that, whether we've got the money, we'll fill your pothole. That, that is the order of the action plan as far as I can see. I know that's a trivial example, but there's no question that that we need to research what climate change is, what people think about it, um, what they'd like to do and what they wouldn't like to do, what the priorities are and what the priorities aren't. They're, they're all published almost annually by the Climate Change Committee, which is the government uh, sponsored national organization of, of, um, of great eminence. 
we know the answers to all these questions. And when I was listening to the answers that had come through from the survey, I don't want to dwell on that particularly. I mean, it was a uh, was it just a piece of work, but um, most of it was motherhood and apple pie. You know, we know what people think. We know where people find it difficult and so on. But we're spending all our money on these paper exercises. And in that respect, I would consider, consider it very sadly, one has to say this is this this project so far has been a waste of money. I, I thank you for that. Um, I, I would suggest to you that, you know, you've always been one of uh, looking at research, uh, Max, and that's exactly what our officers have done. And they've come up with, you know, priorities of buildings, then transport, then community, and the method of dealing with it is via a national, a county and an individual level. And at those levels, that's where you get your interaction as such. Well, with respect to you, are the uh, chairman if you may, of the scrutiny if you may, committee. If, and if, it's if, after the I've just read out to justify. I've just, I've, I've just read out mm. what Katie has told us and what is written in the report. And it is job. at variance. It's your job. It's a, but it's at variance as to what you're saying. And I'm reminding you what's written. And I won't have you change what is written. I now go to the lead member. Thank you, Chairman. Two right. Lead members now. Uh, well, uh, uh, Mr. Pendleton does have a great deal of knowledge because he was a previous lead member of the Environment and Transport Department as a whole. So he's probably well briefed on many of the issues before us today. What I say in direct response um, to your two pointed, um, if you like, point, Max. Firstly, I sense an element of politics in your positioning here, because like I said before in my previous response, I know you care about the environment. You've been one of the most advocate um, campaigners for, for a greener and cleaner Leicestershire. And um, I mean, the alternative to what you're saying is not to have any strategy at all. And therefore, we're going to certainly going to get no further forward in becoming um, net zero um, by 2050, 60, 70, let alone 2045. So I know in your heart that um, you welcome the strategy, although you say it's a waste of time and a waste of money. In terms of the actual actions, you're right, there are hundreds of actions here, but the report very clearly stipulates um, what those actions are, the time scale we expect to be able to implement that action, the cost to Leicestershire, the carbon saving um, in, in terms of small, medium and large, and the deliver, deliver, deliver to, can't pronounce the word, deliverability score um, for, for each of those actions. And what I'm trying to point out here, in the column that says who may be involved, I'll just take one on page 79. It's just a random action um, from the plan that I'm reading out, which is to continue to deliver sustainable travel planning advice and support to businesses and residents through the Choose How You Move campaign. And uh, who may be involved, businesses, districts, health partners, residents, Leicester City. Um, there are a plethora of organisations and um, at the time of putting the micro action plan together, all these organisations need to come together. What we're seeking to do is to work into partnership here, encourage organisations to come together to actually work towards these actions and the de deliverability of these actions. So um, you're right, it's not for us to, you know, with a big lever or a big stick to force these organisations. That's not how this is going to work. What we need to do is act as a, a, a chain, as a partner, um, to use our evidence bases, to use the information that we've invested in, um, to use the skill sets and the knowledge within the authority to help other organisations deliver on these particular actions. And that's where we position ourselves in terms of this strategy. Thank you, lead member. Max, anything else you'd like to um, add? Nothing else. Thank you. Members, any further things? Points? Then uh, I will say thank you, members, for thrashing through that one. Um, and uh, we'll uh, thank the lead member and uh, Joanna for that. And we'll go on to the next item, which is the Environment and Waste Performance Report, pages 1552, 168. Uh, and Joanna is, is going to uh, give us the uh, lowdown on the waste. Chair, um, as you mentioned, the report covers the performance and it starts on page 155 in the pack. 
Uh, this would have come to scrutiny back in September, so apologies we had to cancel that meeting, but it does reflect sort of perhaps how some of the data is somewhat historic, but we are bringing it to you for information. So it covers environment and climate change performance to the end of June of this year, and it includes a mix of national, local indicators, as well as some examples where we don't have direct control, but feel it enriches that picture on the environment. Of the 25 indicators, 16 have been updated for that quarter, and I was only going to focus on the ones that have seen a change in performance. And I'd refer you to the sort of appended dashboards that start from page 163 in the pack. So in short, we've had seven indicators that have improved, two have declined and seven have stayed the same. And the report always explains how those sort of RAG directional ratings are covered and that's covered in the report. So if I, if I go through those cleaner, clean and green outcomes and the various sub outcomes, the first sub outcome is is called people act now to tackle climate change. And there are a couple of improving indicators in that section. We use information that's gathered from the council's rolling community insight surveys, which aim to understand public perception. And those two of those two indicators, 98 percent of respondents feel protecting the environment is important and 60 percent think the council should do more to help to protect the environment. Both of those are a slight improving position. Um, the next sub outcome is nature and the local environment are valued, protected and enhanced. Again, real significant progress on the council's tree planting ambitions, planted well over 100,000 trees to June of this year against a 70,000 target. On the sub-outcome, resources are used in an environmentally sustainable way. So this picks up some of the waste indicators. Um, firstly, the total household waste per household performance has seen a slight improvement as waste decreased from 1,036 kilograms per household to 1,024. And that was to quarter three of 2122 because it's always two quarters in arrears. I think correspondingly, the percentage of waste recycled from LCC sites, so again, that non-operational waste has had an improvement and the recycling performance has increased from 57 to 60%, still slightly short of the 63% target. Um, the number of LCC environmental risks managed has fallen from what well, is, is, is still currently incredibly low, but um, from five to three. We've done some of them at some of the waste sites, fixed some of the drainage, and that's dropped it down to three. So an ongoing improving picture. Obviously, our ambition is to ultimately not have any. Um, the next sub outcome is the economy and infrastructure are low carbon, carbon and environmentally friendly. EV ownership has continued to improve, so 77 up to 86 per 10,000 over the last quarter and up from 38 last year. It does still mean we're in the third quartile, though, and I suppose for context, it does show the right momentum going in the right direction with that doubling of EV ownership in the past year. But electric vehicles are still only representing around 1% of total car ownership, so still lots to do there. Um, carbon emissions per capita in the local authorities influence have improved by 11% to 4.2 tonnes of CO2 per capita and under its 4.8 target. Um, that data is provided by Bayes. I think we've brought that to this committee before, so it's always two years in arrears. And then total business mileage claimed. This indicates declined in performance due to a 10% increase in claims since the previous quarter, and we think that's reflecting the increased work travel post-pandemic. Um, that said, still better than the corresponding period last year. I think that was 2.338 million as opposed to 2.568. And lastly, there are no updates on the final sub outcome, which is strong economy, transport and infrastructure since the last quarter. And with that, I will pause, Chair, in case there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Members, questions? Thank you, Mr. Allen. Thank you. Ah, oh, Mr. Bolter. Talking about your ears. Excuse me, one. just one second. Mr Hunt, would you mind dropping your microphone? Thank you. LCP1 mentioned um, air pollution. LPT2, small amount, 
I think it's about three lines about air pollution. LTP3, nothing about air pollution, if I remember correctly. Will there be something in LTP4 about air pollution? Or, or not? Because it's an ongoing thing. And as far as I can see, the County Council has got its part to play in air pollution with traffic management, everything else. Not just passing it down to the local authorities, but traffic management causes a lot of air pollution, standing traffic, um, timing traffic lights and everything else. But it seems to be ignored by highways department. Um, so I wonder if LTP3, LPT4 might have something in there about air quality. Lead member. Um, in all honesty, you'll need to refer to the lead member for the transport department, Ozzy O'Shea. I think there's a separate scrutiny meeting to do with the transport policies and the plans. Um, but the other consideration is public health. I think air pollution, etc., sits under Louise Richardson, Richardson um, at the moment under public health. And again, the scrutiny panel that oversees their work will also scrutinise the, the air quality issues um, within Leicestershire. But obviously it's reflected in the clean, clean, green clean agenda that we're, you know, in scrutinising um, today. But the actual policies and the the micro detail that you're you're wishing to see, Mr. Bolter, I think needs to be referred to those specific scrutiny panels. The reason I raised it, Chair, is because in my division, uh, I stick a problem with children's wheeze, I think it's called, caused possibly by air pollution. I say possibly by air pollution. There's a trial going ahead at the moment between public health and the county council about uh, traffic movement and about air pollution. So I wonder if that was going to be included in LTP4 so that it gets throughout the whole of the county if we can get air pollution down by various traffic management measures. Through you, Chair, I'll yeah. certainly, along with what Blake's already said, I'll, I'll pick that up with my director and the assistant director for development and growth who manages the production of LTP4 and get an answer to you in terms of what their thinking is around any coverage of air quality recognising the other portfolios that have responsibility, but I'll get your answer. Mr Hunt, your turn. These uh, figures are a bit of a blur, but um, I, I'm really interested to see that um, since it's my first year on this committee, we've got sort of the external um, uh, um, targets, if you like, um, and always look for the greens as well as the reds. Uh, and on the top there, we've got the percentage of domestic properties with energy performance rated C+. They're the properties that um, are um, more energy efficient. And below that, it's got the same thing, but on the opposite end of the scale, fourth um, centre percentile, um, quartile, for the existing C+. Plus. Is that because the C ratings have changed? I'm not quite sure what the difference is between the new and the existing. And uh, if the new ones are more exacting, that means that we're doing quite well out in the community. And if they're not, it would be a really great project for the net carbon zero team to promote insulation and glue their fingers to the sides of buildings until it's done. <laughs> Sorry, I did not say that. Lead member. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure what the point is um i i yeah in retrofitting it's six sorry 163 uh percentage domestic properties with energy performance certificate rating c plus um yeah I, i'll i'll defer to to joe to try and translate that but in terms of the the, the last point you made no it's n never a good idea to glue yourself to anything um campaign and protest so don't don't do that at all through you, Chair, just uh, I'll pick it up with Richard Wilding's team in terms of how we bring the report just for clarity. But new refers to new buildings and uh, as opposed to existing buildings, just for clarity. If, if you could pop your mic on, Mr. 
laptops in its way. I can't uh, see the light. Um, yeah, that certainly indicates that that um, where we have older properties, um, they are in the fourth quartile, and uh, that would be a legitimate target for us to uh, aim at uh, addressing if we could. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. If you could take your mic off and at the risk of being told I'm a lead member, I did look at our strategy for uh, retrofitting uh, and, and it does exist and it is on the website, but I won't say any more because you'll tell me off. Right. Um, have we any other points? Oh, Mr. Bolter. Page 164, uh, I think it's page 164. We planted all these trees in the last 12 months, 18 months. How many are still alive? With the driest summer in many, since 1976, we planted lots of trees last autumn. So though you've got the figures here, how many trees we planted, if they're dead, they don't count anymore. So what are we doing? How do we know how many are still alive? Or what are we doing about those? Or are we altering the figures, those that have died? So the figures that have been presented now could well be wrong. Because you did plant that number, doesn't mean to say they're still alive. Lead member. So um, we have an excellent officer who's leading this program called Adam Goodall at the County Council. And uh, many of those trees that are within our um, data here, um, we've played a part in arranging grants or tying up partnerships with the National Forest or other national organisations, we would have handed out tree packs. So we wouldn't have, in some cases, directly planted those trees. And I dare say from the top of my memory that we um, measure how many die, but that would be a great question to take back to Adam Goodall and see if there is some kind of monitoring of that and uh, what difference that actually makes as as well in the grand scheme of the project. But um, it's a good point and I'll take that back and raise it at a lead member meeting. Thank you. Any further questions, uh, members? No, OK, nothing at all. Then, Joanna, thank you, lead member. Thank you very much. Um, that concludes that item and we move on to uh, agenda item. 10, which is the dates of future meetings which are published here in the agenda. And we take those as read at this point and any other items which I've decided to take as urgent. Um, and as I said before, uh, there were no items uh, to discuss this time. So with that, may I thank you all for your contribution and um, declare the meeting closed.